Okay. Uh, uh, hi, everyone. So uh, before we continue, I just uh, wanted to let you know that there is a, a problem in the in this equation twenty of LDA slide deck. So uh, equation twenty, as you see here, uh, this part. Yeah, I think this part is wrong because if you simplify this equation, uh, there is a bug here. So I'm. Its correct version is this. So, hi. Right. So this is the correct formula for LDA of the two classes. Uh, if you simplify that equation, th this is the correct one. So I'm saying I already made the announcement in the course link, but as it is recorded, I want the, this correction to be recorded as well. So that's one thing. Uh, okay, now. We continue uh, with boosting that we had. Okay, so uh, first off, before we continue with this, uh, I, I wanna say that I said this in the deep learning course too. Uh, I appreciate it if you uh, please recommend this course to your friends and others because for the next semester, these two courses are also offered. And if the department agrees, I will teach them. And uh, there are few, very few people have, who have taken this course, uh, these courses. So in deep learning, only seven out of 50. <laughs> and in uh, statistical machine learning, only 15 out of 50 have taken the course, the courses. Uh, I appreciate it if you please uh, recommend these courses to your friends and others. If, if you want. So that's one thing. Uh, also, I, we, I've made the announcement about the project, the proposal, the midterm, the assignment, some corrections in the assignment. And also I made that correction that you said, thank you very much. So uh, yes, these are the things. And uh, please, for finding, for finding the team members, uh, you can use, uh, you can go to the class list in the course link. There are all the students, you can see them there, there with their emails. Also, you can contact each other in the uh, Teams. We have a Teams chat a group. You can go in there, say there, hi, everyone, I, I'm looking for a team member or something. So you can find each other easily. And what? Is there any? Okay. And feel free to reach out to me if uh, you need any help. So where were we in boosting? Uh, we said, so let's go and have a very quick recap of what we had in boosting. So for boosting, we said, uh, Rather than having one strong uh, model classifier or regressor, let's have several uh, weak ones. But every model works on the weights, the points which are wrongly or poorly classified or regressed by the previous model in a hierarchical way, right? This is what we had. So we said, and it is a meta algorithm. One of the most famous ones is the Adaboost, also called Adaboost, short for Adaptive Boosting, proposed in 1996. We talked about it. Uh, these are the formulas. So then we analyzed why the last function works and uh, how the, uh, the weight is updated. We analyzed that and then we went to theory to in order to prove these equations. Then we said, okay, theory based on additive models, we said, that boosting can be seen as a, an additive model, uh, uh, which is uh, formulated as in equation four. Then uh, what did we do? So we went on and proved the equations of uh, alpha and W. Uh, then we said, okay, let's found an upper bound on the generalization error of boosting. We said 
where boosting works well, because theoretically we can prove that there is an upper bound on the generalization error. What do I mean by generalization error? The error on the test or validation step, which is not used during the training. Uh, so we worked on it. And interestingly, we found out that here, we went over all of these equations and we ended up with equation 23. You remember? So uh, I think as we were in the middle of it, we, it's good. It's a good idea to start from the upper bound again in detail because we were in the middle of it, but very fast. Uh, we review what we had. So we said there is an upper bound on the generalization error of boosting. And uh, in binary boosting, yi is plus one and minus one, okay? So uh, also the sign of the f hat of xi, which is the, uh, the estimated, the aggregated estimation of the boosting for the point xi is also, uh, the sign is important, which is uh, plus one or minus one. Therefore, yi f hat of xi is less than zero. If, if that happens, it means that we have an error, right? Because they should have the same uh, sign. Either they should be both positive one or both minus one in order to be correct. Therefore, uh, equation 15 means the error, which is less than or equal to some theta, where theta is greater than zero. Then it means that uh, this yi f hat of xi uh, uh, is less than theta. Rather than less than zero, we are ac accepting some error, theta, right? Because if uh, they are greater than zero, it means that uh, this is uh, this is correct, but uh, less than zero is error, but we, we give some uh, acceptance of theta, which is a small number. Then we say, okay, do you remember in equation one, which is, was the aggregated one, f hat of x is summation of alpha j, h j, x. Uh, it was the uh, linear combination of the estimations of the models, okay? Then we said we can normalize it. Why? Because the f hat it itself is not important. Its sign is important. So we ended up with equation 16. And then we said, okay, this means error. So uh, what do I do? I replace this f hat of xi with uh, what I have here. And then I rearrange it, rearrange it. So I multiply the sides by the denominator in order to get this equation. And then what do I do? I just rearrange this inequality I bring this to the bring this to the right hand side so it becomes this greater than or equal to zero as this quantity is greater than or equal to zero its exponential is greater than or equal to one because e to the one to the zero is one right then we found this we are repeating it here okay therefore in terms of probability so if the probability of this equals the probability of this right hand side as we just proved. Then, so what is this? This is the probability of error for boosting, right? According to Markov's inequality, we are using this, uh, this formula, which is called Markov's inequality, and it is used a lot in probabilistic models, okay? So probability of x greater than or equal to some a is less than or equal to expectation of x over a. a is some scalar, not random. And probably uh, if I set A to be one, then I will get, get this. Probability of X greater than or equal to one is less than or equal to uh, expectation of X, okay? And interestingly, what? You can, in equation 17, you can take this as X. So if you use that, the, uh, this is the left-hand side of uh, Markov's inequality. And also according to equation 17, this is equal to this one, okay? But according to Markov's inequality, which is equation 18 here, it's less than or equal to this expectation of, and here X is this, right? Expectation of this. So according to Markov's inequality, I, uh, we have this expression. If there is any question, please interrupt me and ask me, okay? So uh, we continue, what did we have? So we found this one in the previous slide. And then we said, yeah, with these two, we found already these two lines. Then we said, okay, this, uh, this ex expectation e to the 
a plus b, we can write it as e to the a times e to the b. So therefore, I can write it as e to the this times e to the, uh, the second term. And e to the second term is not uh, uh, random with respect to the expectation. Therefore, I can bring it out of the expectation. So it becomes here, right? And then what happens? Uh, B, and according to the definition of expectation, I'm replacing this expectation with this definition, right? Recall preliminaries. So we ended up with equation 19. And then we said, stop it here a bit. We go in another path and we'll see they will reach out together. Uh, recall the formula of WI in algorithm. This was the formula of WI in the algorithm of boosting, okay? Then J here denotes the iteration index. So uh, the next WI is updated in this way. It can be restated as this. So I can re restate this inside the, expect uh, uh, inside the EXP, the uh, EXP operator, exponential operator as this, okay? Uh, why? Because YI and uh, HJ of XI are both either minus one or one. Uh, then what did we do? So we said, if we normalize WI, it doesn't harm uh, boosting. Therefore, uh, I'm uh, having, I'm adding this in the denominator ZJ. Uh, the, where ZJ is just summation of all of the terms which can appear in the numerator. So in this way, WI's, uh, WI in the iteration J plus one becomes uh, uh, between zero and one and they sum to one. Okay. Then what did we do? So we had this, I'm repeating it here. And then uh, we said, okay, assume we know that uh, initially in boosting, the weights are uniform, right? Uh, and one to the end. Uh, therefore, we, uh, let's do, it, uh, let's put it uh, recursively uh, in this expression and find this expression recursively for WI in uh, iteration K plus one. If you do that, you will end up with WI uh, at uh, one uh, times one to the ZK to the Z1 times uh, expect, uh, sorry, E to the exponential operator of this times exp exponential operator of this, all of these terms, okay? And then what did we do? Okay, so I'm, uh, I'm stating that this, all of these uh, multiplications by this multiplication, there are K of them. Also in the denominator, in the multiplication of that, Zs, I'm writing them as this, okay? Then what do we do? We know that multiplication of ex, uh, exponential operators can be written as exponential operators of summations, right? Because of this equation, e, uh, e to the A times E to the B, I can write it as E to the A plus B. So I can bring this multiplication as a summation here. And I know that Yi, is not dependent on J, therefore I can factor it out from the summation. I bring it out, y, uh, bring YI out. And then uh, what do we have? So here, the left-hand side is this, the right-hand side is this expression. Uh, this is an expression, multiply the sides by the denominator, this multiplication of ZJs. So it, you can restate this expression as in equation as mentioned in equation 22 here, okay? So we, uh, I'm repeating what we found here in this equation. And then we continue equation 19, which we had stopped, do you remember? Equation 19 that we had found. Okay, let's continue that. So uh, we already found this. And according to this ex uh, equation 22, I can replace this term in e uh, equation 19 by uh, the right-hand side of equation 22. So if I do that, I will get this, okay? So I'm simplifying, I'm deriving the probability of error of boosting. Then what happens? So we have we have found this, I'm repeating it here. Uh, then we know that this is equation 20, I'm repeating it here, and this is equation 21. So is some, therefore, as WI uh, J plus one is normalized, its summation over, end the, over all of the endpoints becomes one. Therefore, I can replace this part uh, to be one. So it simplifies to equation 23, and that's the probability of error. 
By the way, this notation means therefore in, in mathematics. Okay. And on the other hand, according to equation 21, so this is, what is this? The denominator of the W i j plus one because for the normalization. So this is the J. Uh, now let's see what happens. So uh, we can write, we can divide this summation or break it into two summations where this first summation is for the ones which are uh, correctly uh, classified by HJ. And the, uh, the second sum is on the points which are incorrectly classified, okay? So we can do that. And then what do we do? This term e to the uh, e to the minus alpha j is not dependent on i, which uh, i of the summation. Therefore, I can bring it out. Also, likewise, e to the uh, alpha j is not dependent on i in the summation. Therefore, I can bring it out. Then, recall equation uh, twenty for w i j pl uh, plus one, which was this, right? Do you remember this? Then this is in the range zero and one, because I, I told you we normalized it to become between zero and one and it sums to one. And, and its summation is also over, uh, it's some, and therefore, and its summation over uh, error cases can be considered as the probability of error, right? So for the error cases, if I uh, sum them, I know that summation of it over all of the points becomes one, right? But if I sum, sum it, over all of, all of the error points, then it's the, you can see it as a probability of error. Okay, so then what do we do? So we this summation, what is what does it mean? This in this is indicator function for having an error, right? So it means that I'm summing wi's for the error cases. So I can write it. I can consider it to be the probability of error, uh, which is between zero and one, of course, and uh, what what do I do? In, in equation three, recall this was equation three. Do you remember? This was a loss of HJ LJ. We had it in the, one of the initial slides. This is LJ. So uh, I can write it as the loss function because the loss is the probability of error. I, I want to uh, uh, reduce it, minimize it. The cost, which is the probability of error. Okay. Therefore, equation twenty four, which was this equation twenty four becomes this, why? So this is e to the minus alpha j, and this is e to the alpha j, okay, I have it. And this, we just talked about it in equation 25, this is lj. What about this one? This one, this is one minus lj, because this is, you can see this as a probability of correct cases, right? Because this is the summation for the, for summation of wi's, for the correct cases, for the correct uh, classifications or estimations. So I can write it as one minus LJ. Therefore, I wrote ZJ in this, I simplified it in this way. Okay, recall the formula of alpha J in the algorithm. Which one? Yeah. Okay, so uh, do you agree with equation 24 so far? Equation 24. Uh, equation uh, 25, did you understand it? Because uh, I'm summing WIJs for the incorrect estimations. And that you can see it as a probability of error, LJ. So the other way around, if I sum of, uh, over, uh, sum the WIJs over the correct estimations, then it's the probability of correct estimations. So the probability of correct is one minus probability of error. So I can write it as one minus LJ, okay? So is it clear now? Okay, now we have the J. Okay, recall the formula of alpha J in the algorithm. What was that? In the algorithm of boosting, which we just saw, alpha J was this, right? Now scaling it is not harmful to, to other boost. So let's scale it with one over two, with half, and then, we had this in the previous slide, we found this set J. So I'm replacing this alpha J with equation 26. So I have it here. And also this alpha J, I'm replacing it with here. 
and this is appearing here, this is appearing here. Okay, then what happens? So one the minus half, I can bring it in uh, as a power of argument of log logarithm. So it becomes the uh, square root and also one over half, I can write it as a, in, as a power of uh, argument of log uh, logarithm. By the way, this for because of this minus the numerator and this becomes reciprocal, right? Okay, uh, here it becomes reciprocal. And uh, so what happens? Okay, now we know that uh, exponential operator and logarithm are opposite operators. So they cancel each other here also, they cancel each other. Therefore I will get this and this. These two simplify uh, with uh, one, uh, one with this. So, the, and also these to simplify with this one. And uh, so it, it just simplified easily. And interestingly, these two are equal to each other. So it's two times this. ZJ became very simplified, okay? Is it clear? So ZJ became equation 27, which is two square root of LJ one uh, times one minus LJ and LJ is the cost of the HJ, which is a probability of error, which we want to minimize, okay? So what did we found? Equations 26, 27, and 23. Let's uh, uh, recall them all together. This was alpha J, this was ZJ, and this was the probability of error that we had found, okay? Uh, this was the upper bound on the probability of error that we had found. Okay, plug in equation, these three equations in equation 23. What was equation 23? This was equation 23, the um, upper bound that we had found under the uh, probability of error. So what, what are we doing here? Yes, so alpha j, this equation, put it here. So substitute this alpha j with its uh, definition. Also zj, we have it here. So substitute it with this zj. If we do that, we'll get this line, okay? Uh, Rick notes that here we have two inside the multiplication. In multiplication, if I bring it out, because it's a scalar, I can bring it out, it becomes two to the power k, right? Okay, so I think it's, uh, you get, what I'm talking about. And by the way, this one over two, it's inside the summation. I factor it out and bring it out of the summation. It becomes one over two, okay? Yeah, so you should note that these, the difference between these two. Sorry, give me a sec. So you can write it as you can, in summation, you can factor it out because it's not dependent on J. So it becomes this and this is K. So it becomes 2K. However, in this one, you, when you bring it out, it becomes two to the power K. Why? Because it's two times two times two times two for K times. And this, uh, this is one. So this becomes two to the K. So I think we you, you should know the difference between the multiplication and summation for this, okay? So uh, where were we? Okay, here, give me a second. Okay, two to the K, I have it here. I bring it out, okay, bring it out uh, to the very left. And then what do we do? do I'll have this one over two. Uh, I have, sorry, I have theta over two. I have theta over two, so I can bring it inside the summation and then to the power of logarithm. So it becomes uh, theta over two, and uh, I have the rest of the terms as before. Then what do we do? We know that uh, exponential operator of summation becomes multiplication of exponential operators because of this equation, e to the a plus b is e to the a times e to the b, okay? Therefore I can, E, exponential operator of summation becomes multiplication of exponential operator. Interestingly, these two are opposite of each other, exponential operator and logarithm, they cancel each other. So we will have this, 
okay and then then this is multiplication from j uh, from 1 to k this is multiplication from uh, j from 1 to k so i can uh, merge these two terms to have one multiplication right and uh, so and this over two i can write it as a square root therefore i can bring it bring both in, inside the under the square root and uh, the rest is as before okay then what happens so this is the left hand side and uh, also i know that this one and this one can uh, be simplified because this is lj this is lj to the minus theta power right so it becomes this also this and this can simplify each other so i have one minus lj here i have one minus lj to the power of theta so i have one minus lj to the power of one plus theta okay so we simplify the probability of error to become equation 28. So we found this, I'm repeating it here, right? And this is the probability of uh, generalization or true error for the ith uh, instance. And we know that for the ith instance to be less than theta, okay? And we know that theta is greater than, than zero, okay? Then according to equation three, this, do you remember this was the equation of LJ, the last function, okay. We know that LJ is between zero and one because uh, the, the numerator is always uh, less than or equal to the denominator and they sum to one. And uh, we know that what if we have this LJ, if, if we have this, uh, j is uh, less than or equal to half minus z, uh, uh, zeta zeta and zeta where zeta is between zero and half okay then equation 28 which was this this was equation 28 which i'm repeating becomes this so this is the left hand side okay uh, this is the right hand side already that we found okay what do we do now i'm bringing two to the k inside the uh, multiplication so I can write it as two inside the multiplication then I bring these two inside the square root so it becomes two to the two okay then what do I do I write two to the two I break it into two to the one minus theta times two to the one plus theta okay then I have these two terms both with the power of my minus theta, I can merge them. I have these two terms, both with the power of one plus theta, I can merge them. Okay, according to equation 29, my assumption that I had, then what happens? I'm just replacing LJ with, with less than or equal to half minus zeta. As it is less than or equal to half minus zeta, this the whole expression is less than or equal to this, if, uh, if we are plugging LJ to be this, to the right-hand side, okay? So far clear? Then we found this. I'm repeating uh, what we found in the previous slide. This is the upper bound on the probability of generalization, uh, on the probability of generalization error for the boosting, for the ith data point, okay? Then it is a very good upper bound. Why? Because theta is less than less than zeta, right? Uh, because of this, if theta is less than zeta, we have this. So if you consider theta, what was theta? Do you remember? This is it. The probability that y i times f hat xi is less than or equal to theta. We know that yi times f hat xi less than zero is error. And uh, you can see the, uh, yi times f hat xi less than theta as the error, okay? So theta was uh, the some uh, parameter here. If the theta is less than zeta, and what was zeta? Zeta was the parameter which we defined here. It's between zero and half. And I assume lj my loss, or, or the probability of error is less than or equal to half minus zeta in equation 29, 
Okay. If theta is less than zeta, then what happens? This becomes less than one. This quantity, this quantity becomes less than one. Thus, the probability of error, which was this, decreases exponentially with, with k. Note that k is, a, is in the power of the upper bound, okay? And what was k? It is the number of models used in boosting. In other words, this is giving us a hint. In boosting, if we increase the number of models in the hierarchy, the probability of error goes down exponentially, right? So, so it's good. Not only it's polynomial, it's, it's, it's not polynomial, it's exponentially, it goes down very fast. fast. Okay, so that's good. And also this shows that boosting helps us reduce the generalization error and thus helps us avoid overfitting, right? Because this is a problem, uh, upper bound on the probability of generalization error. And this helps us uh, to avoid overfitting. And that's interesting. By the way, this should be, sorry about that. This should be probability of yi f hat of xi less than or equal to theta. This is less than this, okay? It was a typo. Okay, then if zeta is a very small positive number, then what happens? Lj, the Lj less than, well, this was a definition of uh, Lj, we, the assumption that we made. Lj is less than or equal to half minus zeta in equation, in equation 29. We as assumed that, okay? If zeta is a very small positive number, then L, the, this Lj, uh, inequality for Lj is a little smaller than half. Right now, you understand the justification of why. What did I say in the previous lecture? I said in boosting, assume it's classifier binary classification. If each model even is a bit better than random flipping coin, that's a, the boosting becomes very strong. This is explaining. This is a theory for this claim. I assumed LJ. This is the uh, error of the J's model, okay, is less than half minus zeta. If LJ is half means that, what? It's completely random. It's like you're flipping a coin to decide. Half minus zeta, if zeta is very small, it means that it's a bit better than a flipping a coin. Even if every model is a bit better than flipping a coin, the whole model, the whole boosting becomes very good, strong, according to this uh, generalization error. Okay, Perfect. yeah, yeah, exactly. We have the power of K. Uh, so it, it, is, it goes down exponentially. That is this. Then as we are, we are discussing binary classification in boosting, LJ equals half means random classification by flipping a coin. Therefore, for having a great bound for equation of equation 30, which was this, having weak base models a little better than random decision suffices. This shows the effectiveness of boosting. Interesting. Note that a very small zeta means a very small theta because theta was less than zeta. Therefore, it means that a very small probability of error because what was the probability of error? It was yi f hat of xi less than theta, less than or equal to theta. And theta should be a small number, right? Because we know that yi f hat of xi is less than zero is a the actual error, okay? And it is noteworthy that both boosting and bagging, which we talked about, about before, can be seen as ensemble learning because we are both considering ensemble or, or majority voting methods, which use model averaging in the statistics, okay? And are very effective in learning theory. Moreover, both boosting and bagging reduce the variance of estimation, especially for the models with high variance of estimation, such as trees. We talked, we proved that. For bagging, uh, bagging reduces the variance of estimation. Boosting also does that. In the above, we analyzed boosting for binary classification, okay? We can do similar discussion for multi-class classification, okay? Now, boosting as maximum margin classifier. You can see boosting 
as maximum margin classifier. When I say maximum margin classifier, what does it remind you of? Maximum margin classifier. SVM, support vector machines. Okay, it's related. Can you see, can you believe that boosting is related to SVM? In another perspective, the found upper bound for boosting shows that boosting can be seen as a method to increase or maximize the margins of training error, which results in a good generalization error. By the way, uh, the papers which have discussed this, I think I, as far as I remember when I was writing this tutorial paper about this uh, lecture, uh, I, I, I remember they were mostly the Stanford papers by Hasty and Tipshirani and the people in Stanford. Hasty and Tipshirani are very important people in, in the statistical learning. Okay, so it what does it do? It increases the, or maximizes the margins of training error, which results in good generalization error. The phenomenon is the base for the theory of SVM or support vector machines. We already talked about it before. In the following, we analyze the analogy uh, between uh, maximum margin classifiers such as SVM and boosting. Okay. In addition to reference nine, some more discussions can exist. You can take a look at these references. As soon we have training instances, n of them, xi, yi, yi's are minus one or one for binary classification. These are labels. Okay. The two classes may not be linearly separable. May not be linearly separable. Okay. In order to handle this case, we map the data to higher dimensional feature space using kernels, right? In kernel SVM, we do that also. Hoping that they become linearly separate. Assume H of X is a vector which is uh, which nonlinearly maps data to the feature space. So H of X is like phi of X in our previous lectures, right? The pooling function to the Hilbert space, okay? Then considering alpha as the vector of optimization variables, do you remember this was the optimization problem for SVM? Do you remember this? Equation 31. We already saw that in this uh, course. Okay. Note that yi is plus one minus one and alpha transpose h of xi is greater than zero or less than zero. In that, that those lectures, we had beta rather than alpha. Okay. Therefore, the sign of this mean, determines the class of the i instance. Okay. So we had this for SVM. On the other hand, equation 16 was this. Do you remember? Remember, the, we had this in boosting. We can write it at, in vector form as this. So this, we already had it in previous slides. I can write it in this way. What is the denominator? That's the L1 norm of alpha, where alpha is the vector containing alpha 1 to alpha k. Here, alphas are what? Why did I name them alpha? Because these are the, the same alphas that we had in boosting, OK? And also, this is the inner product between alpha, the numerator, and h of xi. Now, compare these two. Interestingly, they are very similar. The difference is what? This is L1 norm. This is L2 norm. You see that? OK. And by the way, alpha j was this in the algorithm. This uh, shows that boosting can be seen as maximizing the margin of classification resulting in a good generalization error. So this also explains why the generalization error of boosting is good. Why? Because the generalization error of SVM is also good. Okay? Because it maximizes the margin. In other words, finding a linear combination in the high dimensional feature space, having a large margin between the training instances of the classes is performed in the two methods, in both boosting and SVM. Okay. Note that a slight difference is the type of norm, and that's interpretable. Why? Because the mapping to the feature space in boosting is only two. You tell me. What is H of XI? See, in SVM, H of XI can map it to anything, depending on the kernel. H of XI is like five of X. But in uh, boosting, what is H of XI? It's either plus one or minus one for classification. So because of the fact that H of XI in boosting can't be anything, so it justifies why we are using L1 norm rather than L2 norm, right? Because L1 norm, what is the, you tell me, what is the derivative of L1 norm? Assuming 1D. In 1D, 
uh, L1 norm becomes uh, absolute value and its derivative is plus one, minus one. Okay, it's the sine fun function, interesting, okay. So another connection between SVM and boosting is that some of the training instances are found to be, some of them are found to be the most important instances. Do you agree or not? In support vector machines, some points are found to be the most important one. We call them support vectors. In boosting, some of the points in, at each of the hierarchy, at each level of hierarchy, some of the points are more important. We weight them more, right? You can see them as support vectors also. Okay, acknowledgement. For more information on boosting in machine learning, see the book of uh, Hasty Tip Shirani and Friedman, The Elements of Statistical Learning, Data Mining, Inference, and Prediction. Some slides are based on our tutorial paper, The Theory Behind Overfitting, Cross Validation, Regularization, Bagging, and Boosting tutorial. This is a good paper. I recommend you to uh, read that. Some slides of this slide deck are inspired by teachings of Professor Ali Kotsi at the University of Waterloo and Professor Hoda Mohamed Zadeh at Sharif University of Technology. Okay? So these are the references. We just see them. But we don't go through them because there is no time much. Okay. These were the references. Now we continue with the next topic, which is Okay. Oh, no, no. The next topic is fitting a mixture distribution. Okay. So the next topic, a bit of shift of gear. Now, we already talked about the basic classifiers and regressors. We talked about bagging. We talked about boosting a bit of shift of gear. We talked about mixture distribution, okay? First off, before that, we need to know about point estimation. What is point estimation? This is a topic in statistics, okay? Used a lot in machine learning. First off, let's talk about maximum likelihood estimation. So point estimation in, in simple words is that when you have some, uh, some data points, these data points have some distribution. And this distribution have some, has some parameters, such as, for example, the moments of the distribution. For example, the, mean, the Gaussian can be determined as its mean and its variance or covariance, right? Every distribution has some parameters. Then let's find these parameters using the sample that we have available from the data. This is called point estimation. There are several ways to do this. Uh, so the parameters of our model, you can see it in this way. So one of them is maximum likelihood estimation. The other one is, there are two famous ones, maximum likelihood estimation. The other one is maximum a posteriori. We'll see them. There is a third one, which is expectation maximization. So I repeat them. At least three things are important in point estimation. Maximum likelihood estimation or MLE, maximum a posteriori or MAP or MAP, and expectation maximization or EM, okay? First off, let's talk about maximum likelihood estimation. Assume we have a sample with size N, so we have N data points, whatever, X1 to Xn. Also assume that we want the distribution from which this sample has been randomly drawn, but we do not know the parameters of that distribution, okay? For example, we know it, it is drawn from a normal distribution, but the mean and variance of this distribution are unknown, okay? The goal is to estimate the parameters of the distribution using the sample available from it as point estimation, okay? This, guys, this, this estimation of parameters from available sample is point estimation, okay? One of 
the approaches for point estimation is maximum likelihood estimation or MLE. Okay, what does MLE do? By its name? Yes, but all of the point estimations do that. But uh, using the sample, they try to find the parameters of the distribution, all of them. But what does maximum likelihood estimation do? But what does it say, name say? It maximizes the likelihood, the likelihood of data, okay? So as is obvious from name, its name, Emily deals with the likelihood of data. So we, what was likelihood, do you remember? This is, this is called posterior. In the base rule, recall the base rule. This is called likelihood. These are priors. This is prior on theta, this is prior on X. Also, the priors are also called marginals. Okay, marginal on X and marginal on theta. Then we postulate that the values of sample X1 uh, to Xn are independent random variables, variables of data, having the, same, the sample uh, distribution, okay? So there are IID. In other words, the data has a joint distribution with parameter theta. Theta is the parameter of the distribution. It can be several parameters, okay? Then, and we assume that the variates are uh, independent and identical distributed or IID variates. So XI, its, distrib it's distribution of, is F of X, XI. But what is this, by the way? I want you to know the notations. What is this semicolon? When we say semicolon here, yeah. it means that, what is what comes after it is the parameters, okay? So F here means the PDF, probability density function. Recall the preliminaries. And the subscript X means that the probability of X, okay? This is the variable of this PDF XI, the which point XI. We set, after semicolon, we have theta with the parameter theta, okay? The theta is a the parameter of the distribution. Then with same parameter, okay. This is the base rule. MLE aims to find parameter theta, which maximizes the likelihood. So theta hat, which is the estimation, is arg max of uh, this, prob uh, this likelihood. The probability of X1 to Xn given theta. Which theta maximizes that? And this is arg max. Which theta maximizes this probability? Okay. This is maximum likelihood estimation. As the points are IID, the likelihood can be written as this. You can write it as F of XI with the parameter theta, okay? So, so what is, that does it mean? They are independent. Therefore, I can consider the, the PDF of each of them independently, F of XI, and then I can multiply them by each other in order to have the joint uh, probability. Okay, because they are independent. Note that in the literature, L of X, so this likelihood, L of X1 to Xn given theta is also denoted by L of theta for simplicity. Okay. Usually for more convenient convenience, we use log likelihood rather than the likelihood. So rather than L of theta, we use a small L of theta. They denoted by a small L of theta, which means log likelihood. But they, they take logarithm of likelihood for several reasons, at least for two reasons. What? One and two. One, exactly. Because uh, logarithm, logarithm of multiplication. Why? Because in, why do we have multiplication? Because we assume usually there are IID. So I will have multiplication of the distributions. Logarithm of multiplication equals summation of logarithm. So I can bring logarithm inside and be it becomes summation and summation is easier to deal with. And uh, the second one is that most of the distributions are in the exponential uh, family. So, so logarithm of EXP, they cancel each other. Okay, they cancel each other. So that's why logarithm of multiplication becomes summation of logarithm. And if this F is an, in an, ex, an exponential family of uh, distributions, then it becomes simplified. So MLE is this. 
you can write it as argmax of log, uh, log likelihood. Doesn't matter. Often the algorithm is not is a the, the logarithm is a natural logarithm. Why? Because usually it is exponential family. So I want it to be canceled. But for the sake of compatibility with exponential in the well-known normal density function. Notice that as logarithm function is monotonic, it does not change the location of maximization of the likelihood. Of course, it changes the maximum value of the likelihood. But we don't care that, about that. We care about the theta, which maximizes that. It doesn't change that. Okay. Now map maximum a posterior, a posterior, whatever. And what does it do? We maximize the posterior rather than the likelihood. This was the posterior, right? So which theta maximizes the posterior? That's the maximum a posterior. And this posterior, you can see it as likelihood times the prior. And the denominator is a constant. You can ignore it because this is the same for everyone, right? So Recall the base rule. We have posterior in the left-hand side. In the right-hand side, likelihood turns prior over some other prior. The prior in the denominator is usually the same for everything. So you can ignore it. So you can write posterior as a likelihood times prior. So we talked about MLE and MAP. Now let's talk about expectation maximization. Sometimes the data are not fully observable, not fully observable. What do I mean? I'll tell you an example for you to understand. For example, data are known to be whether zero or greater than zero. We don't know the exact value. Is this one, 1. 1.5, 1. 1.3 or uh, zero? So it's either zero or greater than zero. For greater than zero, you don't know what value it is. So you have some missing information data. In these cases, we can't use maximum likelihood estimation. We have to use expectation maximization. So expectation maximization is a help for us to do maximum likelihood estimation. Okay, how we see that? As an in illustration, example, assume the data are collected for a particular disease, but for convenience of patients participated in the survey, the severity of the disease is not re recorded but only the existence or non-existence of the disease is reported. Whether I had a disease or not, I don't want to report how much diseased I am, okay? So the data are not giving us complete information as Xi is greater than zero. It's not obvious whether Xi is two or 1,000, okay? In this case, MLE cannot be directly applied as we do not have access to complete information and some data are missing, okay? In this case, expectation maximization or EM in short is useful. The main idea of a EM can be summarized in this short friendly conversation. This conversation is very intuitive and from this, I think you completely understand what EM is doing. Okay, what shall we do? The data is missing. So two people are talking to each other. What shall we do? The data is missing. Log, the log likelihood is not known completely. So MLE cannot be used. What shall we do? Mm, probably we can replace the missing data with something. The missing, we have some missing data. Let's replace it with something. Aha. Uh -huh. Let us replace it with its mean. So let's replace the missing data with its mean, the mean of data, okay? You're right. We can take the mean of the log likelihood over the possible values of the missing data, okay? Then everything in the log likelihood will be known. And then, and the other person says, and then we can do MLE, okay? So basically, what is this saying? I have missing data. I replace it with the mean, and then I do MLE. This is expectation maximization. Assume D uh, observed and D missed denote the observed data and the missing data. So observed data is what? Xi is zero in the above example, for example, and the missing data in the example that we talked about. Xi is greater than zero. Because for zero, we know it's zero. 
For greater than zero, we don't know what is its value. Okay, so observe data or missing data. The EM algorithm includes two main steps, E step and M step. E step is short for expectation step. M step is short for maximization step because EM is expectation. So E step or expectation step, what does it do? It says we had missing data, let's replace it with the expectation or the mean. Okay, so the log likelihood equation four, we had the, the log likelihood is taken expectation with respect to the missing data in order to have a mean estimation of it. Because expectation, you can see it as mean. Okay. Let Q theta denote the expectation of the log likelihood with respect to D missing. So you can see this is the log likelihood. Then given the observed data, expectation of this with respect to missing data. With, so expectation of log likelihood with respect to missing data given the observed data. Okay. This gives me Q theta. So Q theta now is completely known. Okay. Then I can do the M step or maximization step as done in maximum likelihood estimation. In maximum likelihood estimation, we were maximizing the log likelihood, but here we are maximizing Q theta. Okay. These two steps are iteratively repeated until convergence of the estimated parameters. What does it do? Does what? Does it remind you of? This is alternating optimization. So once you optimize it, you find this, then you optimize it. You, it's, you can see it as an alternating optimization. So you tune this equation eight, then you do equation nine. Then you tune it by equation eight, then you do equation nine. Then equation eight, nine, until converges. Interesting. Now, one of the most well-known applications of expectation maximization is mixture distribution in machine learning. Let's see how it is. Introduction to mixture distribution. Every random variable can be considered as a sample from a distribution, okay? Whether a well-known distribution or a not very well-known or, or ugly distribution. Do you agree? Do you agree or not? Every random variable has some distribution and this distribution can be ugly, very weird, or a well-known such as Gaussian or this, okay? Some random variables are drawn from one single distribution, such as normal distribution, but life is not always so easy. So most of real life random variables might have been generated from a mixture of several distributions and not a single distribution, right? It can be a mixture of distribution. The mixture distribution, what is it? It's a weighted summation of K distributions. G1 to GK with parameters theta1 to theta k, where the weights W1 to WK sum to one. So these are the weights of linear combination, right? So you have a linear combination with some weights and the weights sum to one. As is obvious, every distribution in the mixture has its own parameter theta k. So this is the mixture distribution. I can write it as a linear combination of K distribution, subject to the weight sum to one. Okay. The distribution, by the way, this is a discrete. When we usually, when we say mixture distribution, we usually mean discrete mixture distribution. We also have continuous mixture distribution and this summation becomes integral, but that's out of the scope of this course, okay? We usually mean discrete mixture distribution. The distributions can be from different families. For example, from beta normal distribution. What do I mean? I have G1 to GK, each of which might be a different distribution. G1 might be normal, G2 might be beta, and this is. However, this makes the problem very complex and sometimes useless. Therefore, mostly the distributions in a mixture are from only one family. For example, all of them are normal distributions, but with different parameters, with, dif with different means, covariances, and this, right? We aim 
to find the parameters of the distributions in the mixture distribution f of x given theta, parameter theta, as well as the weights. So we want to find what? We want to find theta and w. So these are the parameters we want to find. G is known. G is some distribution. The parameters of G is unknown. So we want to find theta. We also don't know Ws. These are, so how many, uh, how many unknowns do we have? Assume that the distri each distribution has one unknown because it might have several unknowns. Theta might be representative for several unknowns. Assuming that theta is one unknown, each theta, then how many unknowns do we have? What? What? N not two. We have summation. One to the k. At least two. Okay. So it's two k. In each summation, we have two unknowns and we have k summations. So two k. And these w's, the weights in the linear combination, are also called mixing, mixing probabilities because they are the probability of mixing the mixture. Okay. You can see it because they sum to one. That's why you can see it as probability, mixing probability. Now let's use expectation maximization for the sake of mixture distribution and finding these. Okay. We want to fit a mixture of K distributions, G1 to GK to data. Again, in theory, these K distributions are not necessarily from the same distribution family. For more convenience of reader, equation 10 is repeated here. Okay. Then, so in my derivation that I'm talking to you, I'm not assuming G1 equals G2, in, in, in G1 and G2 and GK until GK, they are in the same family. No. Completely general. Gs might be from even different families, but usually they are from the same family. Okay. Then this is mixture distribution, the likelihood and log likelihood for this mixture is this. So this is likelihood. We have theta one to theta K. You can write it as multiplication of F of X I with the parameters theta one to theta K. Why? Because the X's, the points are assumed to be I ID, uh, independent and identically distributed. Then I can replace this F of X I with the parameters theta one to theta K with this summation, right? So, I have, so what do I have? I have multiplication of summation. This is likelihood. I do log likelihood. Therefore, logarithm of multiplication is summation of logarithm. So this multiplication becomes summation and I have logarithm and this is repeated here, okay? Okay, so we had this, I'm repeating it here. Optimizing this log likelihood is difficult. It's very hard, okay? Why? Because the summation within the logarithm, the summation, this summation within the logarithm is a pain in the neck. It's hard, okay? Because logarithm of A times B is easy to deal with because it is logarithm of A plus logarithm of B. However, logarithm of A plus B is very hard to deal with. Right? Okay. We use a trick. I think this trick, for the first time, I, I saw it in Hasty and Tipshurani's book, Some Elements of a Statistical Learning. So what is it? It says, take delta ik. What does it do? So it says, if xi belongs to, if xi belongs to the gk x with theta k, what does, what does it mean? If xi, the point xi belongs to the kth distribution in the mixture, I let this distribution to be one. Otherwise, it's zero. And this is delta ik. So i stands for the which point, i point xi. k stands for which distribution in the mixture. Okay. So delta ik is one if xi belongs to the distribution. Otherwise, no, zero. And its probability. The probability of this, you can write it in this way. Probability of delta ik equals one. What does it mean? Delta ik equals one means that probability of having xi belonging to gk. Okay. 
This is WK, of course. This is the weight in the linear combination for the case distribution. That's correct. Okay, what about probability of this not to belong uh, to the GK? Then it becomes one minus WK because these two should sum to one. Okay, now see what happens. We had this summation, okay? Consider the summation inside the logarithm, inside the logarithm. So I can break it into K, sorry. I can bre break it into K equations, this, this, until this, K equations. This log, log likelihood equals this if delta I1 equals one and the rest are zero. Do you agree? What does this mean? Xi belongs to G1 and none of the other distributions. Right? This, the second one, means Xi belongs to G2 and none of the other uh, the ones. So we will have W2G2 also until WKGK. Okay? So I broke it into several K cases. We had it, I'm repeating it here, what we had in the previous slide. The above expression can be restated as this. What, what, I were, what am I doing? So I can combine all of them by the delta IK because delta IK is either zero or one, right? So we'll have, so this, I'm writing it as this, right? So this one, sorry, this logarithm is here, but I'm also adding this delta IK inside uh, the inside uh, this delta i summation so in other words what am i doing let me repeat it let me repeat it so i have this logarithm it's here okay i have these summations it's here i'm adding these the summation inside the summation delta ik delta ik is either zero and and one. If it is one for one of the k's, then we'll have the k uh, that's one k, and the rest will be zero, right? I think it's obvious. Okay, interesting. Delta i k here is the incomplete or missing data, right? Can I do maximum likelihood estimation on this? This is log likelihood. Can I maximize this? No, I don't know delta i k. Do you know why? I why don't I know delta IK? Because this is exactly the unknown. This is a chicken and egg problem. This is exactly a chicken and egg problem. We want to find delta IK, but for finding delta IK in the formulation, we have delta IK. So what do we do? We do the trick of expectation maximization. So delta IK is a missing data, datum. Because we do not know whether it is delta IK equals zero or one for XI and a specific X, and a specific K, okay? Therefore, using EM algorithm, we try to estimate it, estimate delta IK by its expectation, E step, okay? Now we wanna do E step. So this was the log likelihood containing the unknown delta IK, the E step in expectation maximization. What do we do? I'm replacing this delta IK. So I'm taking expectation of the whole thing, the whole thing. We know expectation is a linear operator. It passes through the summation. So it goes inside, it passes from here and then here, it comes here. This one is not random. It comes out of the expectation, comes here. Note that expectation is over the missing data given the observed data. It comes out, so it, I'm, I mean, the, the W is not dependent on the missing data. That's why it, we can bring it out of the expectation. Then what happens? Del expectation of delta IK given X and theta on one to theta K, right? Why? Why? Because what is this? You can see it as D of observed. You can see this as D of missing. Okay. Then 
Delta I K, now let's calculate this expectation. Okay, how? Delta I K is either zero or one, right? Therefore, this expectation, I'm using the definition of expectation. What was the definition of expectation? Summation of probabilities times the values. We have only two cases. So it's either zero or one. Zero times the probability of that it is zero times plus one times the probability that it is one. Right? Interestingly, this term goes away because it's multiplied by zero. Right? So we'll have, and this is multiplied by one. So it becomes this. The, this expectation is simply probability of that equals one given the rest. This is a good technique in probability whenever we have binary cases. Whenever we have binary cases, zero and one, the expectation becomes simplified very easily because we know the expectation becomes the probability of that being one. Okay, you see that a lot in the papers of probability. Okay, now, according to the Bayes rule, according to the Bayes rule, what is it? We want to calculate this. This equals the joint, the joint probability over the probability of this part. I can write the numerator as this, probability of this given delta i k equals one times probability of delta i k equals one. Then denominator, I can write it as a summation of this probability given delta i k prime equals one times probability of delta i k equals one, but sum over all k i, k primes, right? So in other words, this summation, this is called marginalization in probability. We're marginalizing, okay? So what did we do? I'm repeating what we had. So we had q, theta, one, two, theta, k, expected the expected log likelihood i have this expectation which which is inside the expected log likelihood also have this expectation equals this probability and this probability equals this right the marginal probability in the denominator here in the denominator is what i can write it as this summation of so this summation is the same as this summation W K prime, G K prime, X I and theta K prime. Okay. Why? Can you tell me? That's exactly the mixture distribution. This is, a, what is this? The probability of data. So it's the mixture distribution, right? So I can replace the denominator with the mixture distribution. Okay. Numerator is the argument inside the summation. Because this is exactly, the numerator here is the argument inside the summation. So you can write it in this. So the weight, the weight of the distribution for the case value. Okay. This, so this, what do I say? Okay. This part became this. This probability equals expectation. I denote this expectation by gamma ik, gamma hat ik. Hat is for estimated. So because we are estimating it, we, we use hat. That they usually denote it by gamma in the literature. Okay. So therefore, gamma ik hat equals this. This is the expectation here. Now, what do I do? I use this gamma or this expectation inside the expected log like loop. Right, so I have it here where w i k hat is defined in equation 11. So my expected log likelihood is equation 12, and uh, the term inside it, which is expected in uh, value, is in equation 11. What does it mean? We can easily calculate equation 11, then put it in equation 12. This gives us the expected log likelihood ready for m step. Maximization. Now we don't have any missing data. Missing data is already replaced by the expected value. Now let's 
what do we do? Okay, let's simplify it a bit more. So we had this. Some simplification will help in next step. What am I doing here? So this is logarithm so of this term times this term. I can write it. So logarithm of a, b equals logarithm of a plus logarithm of b. So I can write it in this. I can simplify. Okay. Now, and this is uh, multiplied by both terms. Now the M step. Let's maximize this Q with respect to what are the parameters here? Theta, K, and WK, not just theta K. Theta K and WK, both are unknown. So it gives us theta K hat and WK hat. By the way, theta might be several parameters. For example, in Gaussian, theta is mean and covariance. Okay? Subject to, we know that the weights should sum to one. Right? Okay, note that the function Q theta one to theta K is also a function of W one and until W K. And that is why we wrote it as this. Okay? So we had this, I'm repeating it here. The above problem, again, always we end up with optimization, right? The above problem is a constraint optimization problem, right? We are maximizing it subject to this. So what do we do? Lagrangian. Lagran this is the Lagrangian. Alpha is what? The dual variable, the Lagrange multiplier. Why am I having only one Lagrange multiplier? Because I only have one constraint, and that constraint is a scalar. So its dual variable is a scalar. Okay? So this is here minus alpha times the constraint. This is Lagrangian. Lagrange. Do you remember in the, I, all, I always, yeah. So what do we do now? So this is Q. So the Q, I'm replacing Q with what I found in the previous slide, okay? So I'm repeating Lagrangian here. What do we do in method of Lagrange multipliers in optimization? Take derivative of Lagrangian with respect to uh, both primal variables and dual variables and set them to zero. Of course, when you take derivative of Lagrangian with respect to dual variables, it gives you back the constraint. But with respect to primal variables, it gives you good information. Okay, so let's do that. Derivative of L with respect to theta K, what is it? So this is constant with respect to theta K. This is also constant, it goes away. So this term, where is that? Oh, this term is a function of theta K. <laughs> this is a function of theta K. So what is derivative of logarithm? You tell me. Logarithm, derivative of logarithm of G becomes one over G times derivative of G. Okay, that's exactly what I have done. One over G times the derivative of G with respect to theta K. Set it to zero. Derivative of L with respect to WK. We have it here. This is constant with respect to WK goes away. Also note that this is constant also goes away, the last one. So this also, logarithm of WK becomes one over WK. Oh, by the way, this, we have WK here. Don't forget that. The derivative of this with respect to WK becomes alpha. Why? Where did the summation go? Because it's with respect to WK for a specific K. For a specific K. So the summation goes away. Okay? Then set it to zero. Rearrange it. WK becomes this. Right? WK becomes this. Are you following, right? Okay, then which one, this one? So this is Lagrangian, take, what? Take, this is Lagrangian, take derivative with respect to theta k. What happens? Do you agree that this is constant? Goes away with respect to theta k. This is also constant with respect to theta k, goes away. We only have this term. So this is constant with respect to theta k, we have it here. Derivative is a linear operator. It passes through the summation, 
okay and we know that it's it's with respect to theta k for a specific k therefore this summation goes away too do you agree this because it's for a specific k and here the derivative of you tell me the formula the derivative of g of theta with respect to theta chain rule it's one over g of theta derivative of g of theta with respect to theta this is the formula of derivative of logarithm so i'm using them one over g times derivative okay no problem so here also with respect to alpha if i do that i only have this term and it set it to zero it gives me back the constraint okay now what do we do we say do you remember that we had this plug this wk inside this constraint in order to find alpha so this summation is here this is exactly wk equals one rearrange it it means that alpha should be this okay summation of i to from one to n summation of k from one to k w gamma i k okay then do you remember uh so okay now plug this alpha inside the wk again it gives you this do you see the beauty of math do you see that okay now what solving equations 13 and 14 gives me what theta, theta k and wk why because 13 gives me theta k why didn't i solve this because it is dif solved differently for different distributions depends on distribution equation 14 all uh, these two gives us theta k and wk for every in every iteration why because em is iterative we need to go and do the es step again and then m step here then go to es step again and m step until convergence here it is i'm summarizing it wik hat this is the derivative this is wk so this is the algorithm for mixture distribution initialize in optimization we need to initialize in iterative optimization initialize theta one to theta k and w one to wk the unknowns while not converse so the for the loop until convergence e step and then m step in e step what do i do i calculate w i k hat for all of the i's and k's so it's a nested loop right for all of the i's and k's by this equation okay then e step is done i go to m step i calculate theta k hat and wk hat with these two equations for all of the case for all of the distributions in the mixture this is the m step m step is done then i check convergence how much change i had in thetas and w's with respect to the previous iteration if not converge do again another iteration of em and e step and m step and this is this fits a mixture distribution, mixture of several distributions to data. Okay. An example, Gaussian mixture model or GMM. Gaussian mixture model. A mixture of several Gaussian. Here, for simplicity, I assume the Gaussians are scalar. The various are scalar. We have also GMM for multivariate data. Okay. Here we consider a mixture of K one dimensional Gaussian distributions as an example of for mixture of several continuous distributions. We can have mixture of discrete distributions too. For more information on mix, mixture of discrete distributions such as mixture of Poisson distributions, see my tutorial. The tutorial is called fitting a mixture distribution to data tutorial. You can find it in archive, okay? This is for a mixture of several continuous distribution. Okay, let's see that. In this case, we have what? What is G, K, the Kth distribution? What is it? It's the PDF of a Gaussian distribution with mean, mu, mu K, 
and variance sigma k square. Right? This is the formula of Gaussian distribution. I can write it in this way phi of x minus mu k with uh, over sigma k. This is just a notation, doesn't matter. For all k from one to k. So I'm assuming all of the g's are from the same family of distribution, and that is the Gaussian distribution. Okay. Therefore, equation 10, the equation that we had for the mixture distribution, becomes this where g's are. Uh, replaced by Gaussian distribution, right? And the variables, the thetas are mu one to mu k and sigma one squared to sigma k squared, okay? Then what happens? Equation 11, we already had that. In equation 11, we here we had g, here we had g. I'm replacing g's with phi, the normal uh, PDF of Gaussian distribution, okay? Now Q, let's go to the Q. What was Q? As you see, I don't memorize these things. So this is Q, right? What is it? Sigma I from one to N, Sigma K from one to K, Gamma IK log of W plus Gamma IK log of G. Memorize it, gamma, log of W, gamma, log of G. Let's go back, go to where we were. Gamma, log of, what was, <laughs> gamma, log of what? <laughs> gamma, log of W, gamma, log of G. Gamma, log of W, gamma, log of G. <laughs> Let's see. Gamma, log of W, gamma, log of G. What is log of G? G here is phi, the normal distribution. Okay, what is log of phi? You tell me. Log of phi of x minus mu over sigma. This is log logarithm of this PDF. Let's take logarithm. It becomes the whole thing here. Logarithm of this. So logarithm of multiplication of this and this becomes log logarithm of this plus logarithm of this. So this is logarithm of this plus logarithm of this. Logarithm and exponential operator are opposite. They cancel each other. So we'll have my the inside. The argument inside here. This also, you can see it again, decompose it. It becomes one, this minus one over two is because of square root in the denominator. And also have log of two pi, this is two pi. And these two and the square root cancel each other. So it will have sigma k, but this minus is because sigma k was in the denominator, okay? So I'm repeating it here, what we found, okay? Then what happens? The Lagrangian, here is the Lagrangian. So this is Q, the Lagrangian of the optimization of mix. And this is the constraint, right? Because the mixing probabilities should sum to one. Now take derivative, that time we took derivative of Lagrangian with respect to theta. Now. Theta is mu and sigma, right? So I take derivative of Lagrangian with respect to mu and once with respect to uh, sigma. So let's do it with respect to mu. What is it? So this is constant. This is constant. This is constant. This, this is constant, only this term. What happens? The derivative of this with respect to mu. So this is a squared. I have two. But this the two in the denom in the derivative is canceled with the two in the denominator, and then by the way I have I have this also as a factor multiplied to it, so it becomes this. Set it to zero, rearrange it, it becomes this. It gives you mu k hat as this. So this is the estimation of means, the mean of the case distribution in the in the mixture of distributions. And I think it's obvious why right? it's intuitive. Let's take a look at that. Let's take a look, careful look at equation 17. What does it say? Summation of gamma i k x i over summation of gamma i k. What was gamma i k? Gamma i k was in equation 16. It was the, the amount of the 
the share, how can I say, the mixing probability, the share of the case distribution in the mixture, right? The share. So here it's basically saying that sum the XIs because in the average we sum the XIs, right? But with their shares, with their shares. And then in the denominator, assume that all of the XIs uh, just normalize it. This is a, just the normalization. For example, in simple average, it was one over N, right? This is just normalization. So it makes sense. Equation 17 makes sense. Now, take derivative with respect to sigma K. This is constant. Uh, this is constant. This is constant. These two terms are important. Okay? So the first term, derivative of logarithm is one over sigma. So it's this minus here yeah, becomes here. This also, this is one over sigma squared. So it becomes sigma cubed in the denominator. Set it to zero, rearrange it, gives you this equation, 18. Does it make sense? Yes. This is exactly the formula of variance. Assume gammas, ignore gamma. This is the equation of variance for a scalars, for a scalars. Quadratic, right? Quadratic. Interesting. And WK is the same as equation 14, which we had in the formulas, okay? So we had this. This is W. This is gamma IK. This is W K hat. This is mu K hat. This is sigma K squared. We found all of them. Let's put them, use them in the uh, algorithm of EM. Do it iteratively until it converges. Right? Let's see some simulation. So this is my own simulation done five years ago, as far as I remember. Okay. When I was in the second year of my PhD, as far as I remember. So how, how many years ago? Five years ago. Okay. What was it? By the way, an interesting thing. I failed my uh, uh, background exam with category B. So the, uh, they told me that I have to pass a course in order to pass a, a background exam of PhD. And they forced me to take the course, a course uh, on, uh, I think, statistical statistics or basics of a statistics. And that course helped me a lot. <laughs> so it was a good fail. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I remember uh, for that course, there was an assignment. And I did this simulation for that assignment. And I found out that, oh, my solution is very interesting. So I made it the paper, tutorial paper. And that is the fit in a mixture distribution to data. Okay, that was just in parentheses <laughs> what happened to me uh, five years ago. Okay, so simulation. What is it? A sample with size n equals 2000. By the way, the course was taught by Professor Moon Zhu at the University of Waterloo, and he taught it perfectly. It was a great course. Okay, so a sample, a sample with size n equals two two thousand two hundred from three distributions is randomly generated for this experiment. So these are. What do I mean? This is the mean is minus ten. This is mean zero. This is this mean is five. This is standard deviation of the first distribution the standard deviation of the second, the standard deviation of the third, okay? This. Then for having generality, the size of subset of sam <coughs> sample generated from the three densities are different. So from the first one, I made, I'm, I'm making a synthetic data. Uh, I sampled 700, for the second one, 1,000, for the third one, 500. I, I made it harder for me. I didn't want them to have the same sample size. What did I do? Uh, so I made this distribution. Then I forgot the labels, which got, so first I made a distribution, a mixture distribution, and then I forgot it. Okay, now let me fit a mixture distribution to it. This is what I did. So applying the EM algorithm and using equations 16, 17, 18, and 14 for mixture of K equals three Gaussians gives us the estimated values for the parameters. So if you solve them, it gives you these. And I will show you the plots, okay? 
comparing the estimations, compare these with these. You see they are very close. To, close. This is minus 9.99, very close to minus 10, right? So they're closely converged, okay? With these mixing probabilities, W1, W2, W3, okay? Now let's see some plots here of this simulation. So these are the three, the top left one is the three distributions that I made by myself synthetically. This is the, the plots of convergence for sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. You see, they gradually changed. They were changing drastically, but after a while they converged to these values. These are mu one, mu two, mu three. They also changed, but they converged. This one, is W1, W2, W3. They changed, but they converged to these values, right? Now, see, see the beauty, guys, see the beauty. Note that here, guys, guys, listen. Here, these three were each of which I made as uh, samples for, uh, from, okay? so. This is one PDF, PDF one. This is PDF two. This is PDF three, okay? But now when I consider them all together, I, I uh, fit a mixture distribution. All of them, they become one uh, PDF, okay? Therefore they should sum to one. So the, the mixing probabilities should sum to one. Therefore for each of them, the fitted values are, is less. And these are the three fitted values that I have found, okay? I think it makes sense. These two make sense. And these three is kind of an interpolation of them. Doesn't matter, it, it, it has handled them. So the point here has been handled by both of these. Both of these and these. Do you get it? So that's the thing. Well, the code of this simulation is in, it can be found in this GitHub my GitHub repository, okay? You can go to my GitHub page. I'll find a lot of codes there. This is in our language, why? Because this was, well, I did this as an assignment for a statistics department and they do, the, the professor accepted only R, okay? So, acknowledgement. Uh, to, our tutorial paper, fit in a mixture distribution to data tutorial. Uh, see our tutorial for mixture of discrete distributions such as Poisson distributions, okay? Because that assignment asks us for both Poisson and Gaussian. Some slides of this slide deck are inspired by professor by teachings of Professor Muju at the University of Waterloo. I really learned a lot from him, okay? For more information on mixture distributions in machine learning, see the book of Hasty and Tipshirani and Friedman, Elements of a Statistical Learning. The code of fit in mixture distribution is in my GitHub page. Also, you can find it in a scalar. Let's see. Let's see this. This is useful. Just give me a second. You see this? So scalar.mixture.gaussian mixture. This gives you Gaussian mixture model, GML. You can use this in order to fit a mixture of Gaussian distributions to your data, okay, in a scalar. Okay, now let's go back to uh, the slides. So these are the references. This is our tutorial, fitting a mixture distribution to data tutorial. And this is the book of elements of a statistical learning. Data mining inference and prediction. Okay, let's have a break. Come back at nine and we'll continue with PCA and then FDA. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we continue. 
Okay, now we continue uh, with principal component analysis. Again, another shift of gear. We go to what? Dimensionality reduction methods. Okay, so dimensionality reduction is a wide, really wide area, sub area in machine learning. Okay, what does it do? It reduces the dimensionality of data. But why is it useful? For several reasons. First, compression of data. Another one, feature extraction from data. You want to extract useful features. Because maybe in raw features, classes might be confused with each other. But after you extract features, the classes might be discriminated. Or some other things, uh, just for regression, better representation of data. And different, different things. So for different reasons, you, wanna, you may want to do dimensional reduction. And as I said beforehand, even you can see deep learning as a stack of several dimensional reduction algorithms because each layer is extracting some features, something like that. So one of the most fundamental ones in the dimensional reduction is principal component analysis or PCA in short. Let's go. Sometimes some, for some things I might go a bit faster, but please read the slides for uh, more information about that. But I think I go with a good pace so you understand everything. So projection and reconstruction in PCA. Feel free to interrupt me whenever uh, you have any question. Okay. So what did we say? If, assume if there exists n training data points, xi from i to n, okay? And I don't have any label here, okay? The projection of a training data point x is this. Recall preliminaries, okay? Recall preliminary. And what is this? X, I don't know how to pronounce it. X, let's call it, what do I call it? Uh, X uh, back hat. <laughs> X back hat is what? It means centered data. I have subtracted the mean of data from the data points. From each of the data points, I have a cloud of data points. So it has a, there is a mean. For every data point, I have subtracted that data point. I have subtracted the mean from the data point. So it gives me x back hat, and we will see. We need to subtract the mean in PCA, okay? So then u transpose x back hat is x tilde, is a projection. We already talked about it in the preliminaries. If x is d-dimensional, I assume that uh, after projection, it becomes p-dimensional, okay? So, uh, and as I said, x back hat is the x minus mu x, and mu x is the mean of data. And both x and x back hat are d-dimensional. Okay, x back hat is a centered data point. So mu x is d-dimensional vector, and that's the mean of the data points. Okay, then mean of training by the training data set. Guys, listen, I, some, for some of you might be boring, but it will become interesting. I, would, I assure you, it becomes interesting. So the reconstruction of training data point X after projection, what is it? So do you remember this was, so U transpose X back hat is projection. U, U transpose X back hat is reconstruction. However, as we had removed the mean, we need to add back the mean. So we have plus mu X, okay? You can see it as U X, tilde, x tilde was the projected data, plus mu x. And that gives me x hat. And x hat is a reconstructed data after projection. And that's d-dimensional. Note that not necessarily x hat equals x. There might be a residual error. Recall preliminaries of this uh, course. Okay. In PCA, all data points should be centered, that is the mean should be removed first. The reason is shown in this figure. In figure A, we haven't removed the, the mean and if we apply PCA, it gives us something like this, completely nonsense, nonsense. But if we subtract the mean, then it gives us the directions for the covariance of, of the spread of the data, okay? However, in some applications, centering the data does not make sense. For example, in natural language processing, the data are text and centering the data makes some negative measures, which is nonsense for text. And we have negative text. 
It's not, it's not, it doesn't make sense. Therefore, data is not sometimes centered and PCA is applied on the non-centered data. But if we do that, that's called, that's not called PCA anymore. That's another name, algorithm. And that's called latent semantic indexing, also called latent semantic analysis, LSI or LSA. Okay, so PCA without centering data calls, is called LSI or LSA used in, especially in natural language processing. If we stack the end data points column wise in the matrix X, X1 to Xn is D by N dimensional, then we, what do we do? So before had, uh, in that slide, we had one point. Now we are having N data points. So I can write, so the X is a data set, but X back hat is a center data set. It's D by N stacked column wise. Each column, from each column, we are removing the mean, okay? And recall preliminaries. We can write it as X, H. H is the centering matrix. We, we talked about it in the elect, uh, preliminaries. And H is defined as this identity matrix minus one over N, one, one transpose. And this one, one transpose is the matrix of all ones. But I is the matrix with the, with the diagonal matrix of ones. Okay, and x back hat is uh, its columns are x one back hat until x n back hat. You can write it as this also. Center data. Okay. Then the projection and reconstruction. This is projection, so it becomes p by n. But at per reconstruction is u u transpose x back hat plus mu x because we need to add back the mean. It will be d by n. Not necessarily we have x hat equals x. There might be some residual error. Okay. Now we can also project a new data point. So we talked about projection and reconstruction. By the way, you might be wondering, how do we know u? I haven't yet talked about it. We will, the whole algorithm of PCA is finding that u, okay? But I'm, first I'm talking about projection and reconstruction. So far we talked about training data. Now test data, okay, test data. Test data is not used in training. This is also called out of sample data, out of sample data or test data. So what do we have? A new data point, we wanna project it onto the PCA subspace. Okay, U transpose X projects data on the PCA subspace. Okay, if U is determined by PCA algorithm, then we wanna do that. So in other words, the new data point has not had impact in constructing the PCA subspace. It's test data, okay? This new data point is also referred to as test data point or out of sample data in the literature. Equation seven was for projection of X onto its PCA subspace, yes? Now, now we have XT, subscript T. T stands for test, okay, here. XT denotes the out of sample data point. Its projection is XT tilde, and its reconstruction is xt hat. So it's the same as before. U transpose xt back hat and its reconstruction is similar to before. However, note that now u xt haven't had any impact on finding u. Previously in the training data, x training data was used for finding u. But here u is not impacted by xt t. And also an important thing, XT, sorry, an important thing. What is that? So, and an important thing. What is that? Equation 11. Take a look at that. XT back hat is XT minus mu X. What is mu X? The mean of training data. So you need, even for test data, you need to center it using the mean of training data. You shouldn't uh, include the test data in, for calculating the mean, okay? That's an important thing. Okay, if we consider all of the several te test data points together, assume NT of them, then you will have XT, X capital T, it will be D by NT, and its projection and reconstruction is like this, as before. Its, its projection will be P by NT, and its reconstruction will be D by NT. Again, not necessarily XT hat equals XT, okay? 
Again, here we are using for centering, we are using the mean of training data. Now, PCA using eigen decomposition because we can do find the U in PCA in two ways at least. One of them is eigen decomposition. So, if P equals one, it means that it's one dimensional subspace, right? Then matrix U becomes a vector U, one, one direction, right? One, one column. Uh, then what happens, I have a vector U. So its reconstruction will be U, U transpose X back hat, but U here is a vector now, not a matrix. And X hat is the reconstructed X, okay? After the uh, projection. Assume we are ignoring the adding the mean back for now, okay? I'm ignoring adding the mean back. Yes, I, I assume that the mean was already zero before the PCA, okay? Now, the squared length or a squared L2 norm of this reconstructed vector is this. So I can replace X hat by UU transpose X back hat as it is a squared L2 norm, it's quadratic, I can write it as this. This transpose itself, okay? This transpose, when I apply it in the parentheses, it changes the order. So I will have this. Interestingly, UU transpose is one because I know that what I found later in PCA, it will be a solution of eigen decomposition. So U is what? A eigenvector and eigenvectors are Orth orthonormal, okay, to each other. So u u trans u transpose u is one. So I will get this x back hat transpose u u transpose x back hat, and as this these two are scalars, I can change their orders in the uh, inner product. So it becomes u transpose x hat x back hat x back hat transpose u. That's correct. Okay. Then what do we do? Suppose we have n data points, x1 to xn, where x back hats are the center data. Okay, the summation of the squared lengths of their projections, now I have summation. So this is for one of the points, now I have summation. I can bring this summation inside. So I will have this. U transpose, summation of xi back hat, xi back hat transpose u, okay? Now, for now, assume I want to talk about, so remember this, we'll get back to this equation 16. But now think about another thing. X back hat is D by N, right? The centered data. What is the covariance matrix? Do you remember what was the covariance matrix? Can you tell me? I from one to N, X I minus mu, X I minus mu transpose. I named xi minus mu by xi back hat. So I can write it as summation of xi back hat, xi back hat transpose. You might be wondering where this one over n went. I ignore that. Doesn't matter in PCA, okay? For now. You can put it. You can put it. You can uh, take it away. It will show its impact in the eigenvectors. Doesn't matter. If I drop it in the optimization, it will be absorbed in you, okay? Then what happens? So covariance matrix is just D by D. What, is, what does this covariance matrix mean? Across the dimensions, so it's diagonal, means that for each dimension, what is the variance of data? Between the ijth element of covariance matrix, which means that what is the covariance between the ith dimension and jth dimension? And this is a symmetric matrix, right? Okay, so it's a D by D. And this is, I can write it in matrix format in this way. So X capital bar uh, back hat, X capital back hat transpose. And according to equation five, we know that X back hat, I can write it as X H, where H is a centering matrix, recall preliminaries. So I can write it and X H transpose, it will be H transpose, X transpose. I know that the centering matrix is symmetric, recall preliminaries. So I can replace H transpose by H. I know that H 
is idempotent, idempotent, sorry, idempotent recall preliminary. So H H becomes H. Right? Okay. And this S, which was X, H, X transpose, is the coherence matrix. If the data was already centered, there the mean was already zero, then S would be simply become X, X transpose, right? That's awesome. Okay. Guys, listen, that's important. So plug equation 17 in equation 16. So this is S, right? This is S in the middle. So, so this summation, the left-hand side equals U transpose SU. So we can also say that U transpose SU is the variance of projected data. Why? Because the variance is quadratic format, right? And this is also quadratic. Also proved here, I said this, you can see it as uh, this S, you can see it as a coherence matrix, but I'm, now I'm analyzing U transpose S U. You can see it as the variance of U transpose X, uh, X back hat. This makes sense because when some non-random thing here U is multiplied to the random data X back hat, it will have a squared or quadratic effect on the variance. Why? Because variance is quadratic, right? Therefore, U transpose SU is quadratic uh, in U, and therefore you can see U transpose SU as the variance of U transpose X back hat. In simple words, U transpose SU can be interpreted in two ways. In two ways. You can see it as the variance of projection. What do I mean? Project data after projection, what is its covariance? It will be U transpose SU. What was S? Covariance matrix before projection. After projection by U, it be, the covariance matrix becomes U transpose SU. So S becomes U transpose SU. X becomes U transpose X. S becomes U transpose SU. So let me write it. X becomes U transpose X. S becomes U transpose SU. Right? I just also, uh, in another way, you can interpret it as a squared length of reconstruction. I just proved it in the previous slide. Here it is. This is a squared L2 normal uh, reconstructed data. Right? I don't know why you seem confused. <laughs> I have some data points. The data points before projected or before any projection. Do you agree that I have some covariance matrix or no? I denote it by S. S. Sometimes we denote it by C, whatever. Okay, I denote it by S. And that's calculated in equation 70. Okay. Now I project every data point to some subspace, PCA subspace. Every data point XI becomes U transpose XI. Do you agree? After this projection, I calculate the covariance again. It is U, this covariance becomes U transpose SU. Because projected data was U transpose X and the variance of U transpose X should become, you tell me, you tell me. Covariance matrix, the covariance matrix of U transpose X, U transpose X, T. Do you agree? Do you agree that this is the covariance of projected data or not? Do you agree? Because this is projected data. This is projected data. This is the covariance of projected data. If I simplify it, it becomes what? U transpose X back hat, X back hat transpose U transpose. What was X? Back hat, X back hat transpose. It was S. It's summation. It's summation. So in other words, I have U transpose summation of X back hat, X back hat transpose because I can bring this summation inside. U, what is this? This is S. So U transpose SU. In other words, U transpose SU is a covariance after projection. Okay. 
I said, I explained this for three times, I guess. Did you get it? I, okay. If you have any question, ask me. So we want to find the projection direction U. This is the algorithm of PCA, which maximizes the squared length of reconstruction or variance of projection. What does it mean? I have some data points. Hypothetically, with some hypothetical U, I will project it to some subspace. I want to find use in a way that after projection, I, the variance of projection is maximized. So if I maximize this variance of covariance of projection, projected data with respect to U, subject to U transpose U equals one. Why? Because I want it to be orthonormal. If I don't use this constraint, what happens? It is ill-posed optimization problem. This maximization goes to infinity. I need to constrain, okay? Then the rest is simple, simple. We already know that everything. I have talked about it in preliminaries. What is this? Lagrangian, this is Lagrangian. Lambda is a dual variable. Take derivative with respect to u, set it to zero. It is an optimist, it is an eigenvalue problem for matrix S where u is an eigenvector, lambda is an eigenvalue. Recall preliminaries. As you see, we are seeing using preliminaries a lot. So S and U here, the eigenvector, and L, which was the dual variable, became the eigenvalue of S. Interesting. And S is covariance matrix before projection, covariance of matrix of data. Note that lead, the leading eigenvalue is the largest one. Why? We already have one eigenvalue here, okay? But if we, we will see that if we have several uh, directions, if U becomes a matrix, because of this mix maximization, we need them to sort the eigenvector from largest eigenvalue to smallest eigenvalue. Here, as we have only one dimensional subspace, we have only have one eigenvector eigenvalue. There is no need to sort, okay? Okay. And note that PCA direction, uh, which is U, U is PCA direction, is also called principal direction or principal axis, hence the name principal component analysis. Okay. The dimensions or features of the projected data onto PCA subspace are called principal components, hence the name principal component analysis. In equation four or eight, if P equals, if P is greater than one, it means that what? So if P was one, we were projected, we were projected on one vector. If we have several U's, what does it mean? We already talked about it in preliminaries. We are projecting onto the span, a space spanned by these vectors, right? So you have, in other words, we are projecting X uh, back hat onto the column the space of U, recall preliminaries. So I have this, now the same thing. However, now I have Frobenius storm rather than L2 norm. It's a matrix. So the same thing as before, U transpose U is I, Y because U is an orthogonal matrix. Its columns are orthonormal. So with a similar explanation, the squared Frobenius norm of X hat is, tra is trace of U transpose SU. I have trace. Why? Because because a squared Frobenius norm, I can write it as trace of this transpose itself. Recall preliminaries. Okay, so again, we can see this trace of U transpose SU as either a squared Frobenius norm of uh, or a squared length of what reconstructed data as according to equation twenty one or covariance of projected data. Okay. So I maximize this. Now I have trace. Trace of U transpose SU with respect to matrix U, subject to U transpose U equals I. I want U to be an ortho orthogonal matrix. If I don't have this, this will be an imposed optimization problem. Goes to infinity. We are maximizing this. Okay. Again, Lagrangian, we had it in the preliminaries. 
take derivative with, of Lagrangian with respect to u, set it to zero, okay? We will have SU equals U uh, lambda. Then, and lambda, what? Okay, lambda are the, is the diagonal matrix of the Lagrange multipliers. However, however, uh, it became the eigenvalues of S. U is the matrix of eigenvectors of S, okay? By the way, if you want to know why uh, lambda is diagonal, because many people emailed me from across the world saying that in the tutorial of eigenvalue decomposition uh, problems, saying that why do you say it is diagonal? We worked out many people together and we found the proof. For proof of why it is diagonal matrix, see the appendix of the tutorial eigenvalue and generalized eigenvalue problem tutorial. Okay, see that. In the appendix, we have proved why it is diagonal. Uh, never mind. So, equation 23 is the eigenvalue decomposition of S, where the columns of U and the diagonal, so the columns of U are the eigenvectors of S, and the diagonal of lambda are the eigenvalues of S, where S is a coherence matrix before projection. Okay? And the PCA subspace is now spanned by U1 to UP, the eigenvectors. Recall preliminaries. Okay, so now, by the way, as we have here uh, maximization, we need to sort the eigenvectors from largest eigenvalue to smallest eigenvalue. Not truncating u, u is, becomes d by d. We can truncate it to have smaller number of columns, okay? Why? Because if we don't truncate it, what happens? You tell me. You're projecting it from a D-dimensional space to another D-dimensional space. It's not projection onto a subspace. It's just you're rotating it in the same space. It's just a rotation. However, if you truncate it, then you are projecting it onto a subspace. Okay? So, if rank of S is D, so do you know rank of matrix? If you don't know, take a look at rank for in linear algebra. It has also, I think you can search it on Wikipedia too. So if rank of S is D, then we have P equals D. It means that uh, U is a square matrix. U is a square matrix, okay? Then the dimensionality of PC subspace is D. As I said, it's, uh, it's not projection onto a subspace, okay? Then U becomes a square matrix D by D. Therefore, U, U transpose, and U, uh, U transpose, U both become identity mat matrix because U is an orthogonal matrix. So you can replace U transpose with U inverse and U inverse, U and U, U inverse are both identity matrix because U is a square matrix, okay? And in this case, as I said, it's just a rotation. Take a look at this. So these are the main axes of data, okay? Then I, so S, the coherence matrix becomes two by two here, two dimensional. My U becomes two by two. If I don't truncate it, I use both of the columns of U, then what happens? I have used both of P1 and P2, principal axes one and two. Then, what does it mean? It simply means that I have to replace these two axes with P1 and P2. So it's just a simple rotation, right? It's just a simple rotation. Okay. If rank of S is less than D and N is greater than D, it means that we have enough data points, okay? But the data points exist on a subspace. So, so what do I mean? Rank of S is less than D. It means that U is D by P dimensional. So it's truncated, okay? But assume D is less than N. N is the number of points, okay? Then what happens? It means that there, we have enough data points 
but the data points exist on subspace and do not fill the original space wide enough in every di direction. That's why we can, we can truncate it because P less than D is enough. A smaller number of uh, PC directions are enough than D. We, we are allowed to truncate U. Then it's projection onto a subspace. There are some other cases, such as rank of S is less than N minus one, but N minus one is less than D. So I'm reducing the rank of S one by one with different cases and I'm explaining them to you. What does this mean? It means that we do not have enough data. N is less than D. We have, if D is five dimensional, then we have less than five points. If we don't have enough data points to properly rep represent the original space and the points have an intrinsic dimensionality, then again, U is truncated in this case. Okay. So if we are truncated, truncating the matrix U, then U, U transpose is not identity anymore. But U transpose U is always identity, even if it is truncated. We already have talked about it before in this course, okay? Here again, you can see that if I use both P1 and P2, it's just a simple rotation from these two axes to P1 and P2. However, if I only use P1, then I'm projecting onto a subspace, one dimension, okay? Now reconstruction error in PCA. So, do you remember once I said, PCA says, I want to maximize the variance of projection, right? You can see PCA in another way. It minimizes the reconstruction error. We'll see that. If we center the data, the residual or reconstruction error becomes what? X back hat minus X hat, right? Because X back hat is the da original data minus mean. And X hat is a reconstructed data. Assume I haven't added mean to X hat, okay? Because the reconstructed data will be will also be centered, okay? According to equations two and four, so this is residual. So if I bat, add uh, mu hat here and I had mu, these two cancel each other, doesn't matter. So basically the residual is, is X back hat minus U, U transpose X back hat. I think it's obvious. You have X back hat projected by U transpose, reconstructed back by U. So it becomes U, U transpose X back hat. But what you, we had before projection was X back hat. Okay. Do you see this? If I don't truncate you, if I don't truncate you, U is a square matrix. Then U, U transpose becomes identity. I think it's obvious. Why? In the same space, I rotate, I rotate it back. I will be in the same place. I rotate, I rotate it back. The residual will be zero. But if I project it onto subspace and come back, I have some loss of information because of projection onto subspace. Okay. And this residual error is like this. Consider this, assume I project onto, onto one dimensional subspace. So this point is projected here. This point is projected here. For example, this point is projected here. I think you get uh, my point, okay? Then I just see these, these points on a one dimensional space like this, okay? And as you see, I have some errors. These are the residual errors. You should note that this is different from mean squared error in regression. What was mean squared error in regression? It was this. One important thing, there is a difference between residual error in PCA and mean squared error in regression, right? Okay, that's one thing. So this is residual for all of the data points. Then I can say, this is a squared Frobenius norm of residual error for all of the data points, okay? X back hat minus U, U transpose X back hat. So I'm assuming I have several data points and I have several PCS 
uh, directions too, okay? If u is a square matrix, this residual error will be zero, but u is not necessarily a square. Now, this time, I want to minimize this error, not maximum, with respect to u. And subject to u, u transpose equals i, because I want the uh, a projection matrix to be orthogonal. And this is for not having ill-posed optimization, right? Uh, then what happens if you uh, we simplify this because we can write it as trace of this transpose itself. I apply this transpose inside the parentheses. It gives me this. I multiply the terms to each other. It gives me this. Interestingly, u transpose u equals i according to the constraint. Then I have this. So I have it becomes this. Trace I can is a linear operator. I can apply it on the elements. Then this I use the cyclic property of trace. So I can move the elements of trace. So I will have this. This is the Lagrangian. I form the Lagrangian. So this is the constraint. This lambda is a diagonal matrix containing the Lagrange multipliers. Okay. Again, take derivative with respect to u, set it to zero. Do it, it gives me this shocking. Interestingly, this gives me the same solution as the other optimization problem. So two optimization problems result in the same solution. That's why you can see PCA as maximization of covariance after projection or minimization of reconstruction error, okay? In linear models, there is no algorithm better than PCA for reconstruction error in linear models. Okay, because we just proved them. So PCA subspace is the best linear projection in terms of reconstruction error. In other words, PCA has the least squared error in reconstruction, in reconstruction, okay? Now we saw that PCA is the best in reconstruction error for linear projection, okay? Assume, if we have several linear projections back to back, M of them. So M times I'm projecting. So to U1, then U2, then U3 until UM, several projections. Do you get my point? I assume I have five dimensional data points. I project it onto a three dimensional space, subspace, then from three to two dimensional subspace, then from, from two to one, something like that, okay? So it's a hierarchical. Then I reconstruct them back again. U1 until UM. Sorry. Then I reconstruct them back again. Okay. Then add the mean. It gives me x hat, okay? However, I can collapse all of these into some u double something, u double that dot, okay? I can rename the whole u1 to um to be u double dot. So u double dot transpose becomes um transpose until u1 transpose. Therefore, this equation 28 can be re restated as this. In other words, if I have successive uh, uh, linear projections and reconst uh, reconstructions, you can see it as one linear projection and one, one reconstruction, right? Why did this happen? Because I don't have any nonlinearity between them. Linear operator and another linear operator, you can see it as another linear operator, right? Therefore, if we have an autoencoder, so assume this is an autoencoder without any activation function in the, in the layers, okay? So this is encoder, this is decoder. This is after three projections, this reconstructed. So these two, this is X, this is X hat. These two should, should be as much as similar as possible, okay? There is no activation function between them. It's just reduces to one PCA algorithm. If you solve this, uh, autoencoder with back propagation without any 
activation functions, it's roughly at the end after convergence, it gives you PCA subspaces. Can you believe that? If you solve it by backpropagation, it gives you the PCA solution. Okay. Okay. PCA using singular value decomposition. So the PCA can be done using singular value decomposition or SVD of X uh, back hat. So in the previous slides, we talked about using eigenvalue decomposition for PCA. Now we can use SVD for PCA. How? So eigenvalue decomposition, we did it for S covariance matrix. We did the eigenvalue decomposition on covariance matrix. But for SVD, we do SVD on the centered data, not the covariance matrix. The centered data is D by N, so it becomes U sigma V transpose. And it makes sense. SVD, you can do it on non-square matrices too, rectangular matrices too, and X is not necessarily a square because the dimensionality is not necessarily equal to the sample size, the size of the, the number of data points. Okay, you, I'm using complete SVD. Okay, what does it mean? Recall preliminaries. U is D by D is the left singular vectors or equivalently eigenvectors of X, the back hat, X back hat transpose for proof, see the preliminaries. V is N by N right singular vectors or equivalently eigenvectors of X back hat transpose X back hat for proof, see the preliminaries. Sigma is D by N, a rectangular diagonal matrix whose diagonal entries are singular values or equivalent to the square root of eigenvalues of X, X transpose or X transpose X. For proof, see the preliminaries. Okay. According to equation 17, what was equation 17? Do you remember? This, we proved that this is the covariance matrix after, this is the covariance matrix before projection. Do you remember? X back hat, X back hat transpose, right? X back hat is the center data. So guys, please listen. X back hat, X back hat transpose is a, a covariance matrix before projection, okay? What was the solution of eigenvalid? What was the solution of PCA? Eigenvectors of, you tell me, covariance matrix. Eigenvectors of covariance matrix, which means eigenvectors of X, X transpose. Because covariance matrix is X, X transpose, right? We just said eigenvectors of X, X transpose is what? U. I'm repeating. PCA was what in the previous slides? Eigenvectors of U. Eigenvectors of S, covariance matrix. What is S? Is X, X transpose. So I want eigenvectors of X, X transpose. I just said that according to the preliminaries, U is the eigenvectors of XX transpose. So I can use SVD of this X and use its U. It's the solution of PCA. Interesting. PCA can be found in two ways. Either you do eigenvalue decomposition on covariance matrix, take its eigenvectors, or you do singular value decomposition on the center data and take its left singular vectors. Both are equivalent. Interesting. It has its benefits. It has its benefits. So an interesting thing is that SVD of X, uh, ha X uh, back cat, the columns of U are automatically sorted. And interesting about SVD solution is that it already automatically source for you. You don't need to sort them, eigenvectors, from the largest eigenvalue to the smallest eigenvalue. One important thing. Okay, just one, the last slide in this, I think, in this slide deck, and we will continue later. So first off, first off, just give me a second. Let me tell you why, can you tell me why SVD is useful sometimes rather than eigenvalue decomposition? Can you tell me? If you tell me, I will dance. <laughs> what? Eigenvalues are? Eigenvalues are already sorted. That's one. Yes, that's exactly one. 
That's exactly one thing. D by D by N and by D D by D. This gives give me a second D by yeah. That's I think that's the only solution. <laughs> Then I wanted to say something about, but that was for dual PC. I, I just got confused myself. Okay, that's it. So there are two ways. Determining the number of principal directions. So usually, guys, usually in PCA, the components with the smallest eigenvalues are cut off. Now I want to see how to truncate you. How do I truncate? How do I know how many columns should I preserve and the rest I should throw away, right? How to determine P? So there are two ways, at least, at least two ways, a scree plot and ratio. In a scree plot, reference seven, it is a plot of the eigenvalues versus sorted components. What do I mean? So do you remember? We sort the eigenvalues from largest to smallest. So we can plot it them in this way, largest then smaller, then smaller, 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 something like that. So usually they become like this because they are not symmetric. Usually the cloud of data is not symmetric. As it is not, if it is symmetric, what happens? The eigenvalues will be almost equal. Eigenvalues, okay? As it's not symmetric, usually squid, skewed, then it will be something like this. Suddenly it drops, suddenly it drops. If something like this happens, do we see the knee of this plot and we say, okay, this threshold, I only, the, the first two components are enough because the first two eigenvalues were very big and suddenly it drastically dropped. That's called a scree plot, okay? Uh, so another way is a ratio. What is the ratio? It's this, lambda j over summation of lambda k, S similar to the uh, scree plot, but it says that I want to see what percentage of the, the if I sum all of the eigenvalues, what is the percentage of this eigenvalue, the k, -th, the j -th eigenvalue in the whole eigenvalues? Okay. Then I, using this uh, percentage, I can say which eigenvalues are more important. So I only keep those. Okay. So these are the ways. In the next session, we will continue with this. This is the agenda. We'll talk about dual PCA and then kernel PCA and then supervised PCA. And then we go to feature discriminant analysis and kernel FDA. So one thing you might be wondering this question, I wanna answer it. Why are we going so deep in these algorithms? There is a reason, because these are good techniques in machine learning. Not only I'm teaching you PCA, but also I'm teaching you the techniques in machine learning, okay? But later in other algorithms such as LLE and this is, although they have very, a lot of variance, I'm not going into their depth, I will refer you to my tutorials, okay, for more information. But for these algorithms, I have a reason for going into depth. For example, in kernel FDA, I will teach you the second way to kernelize the algorithms, okay? The first way was that kernel trick. We saw it in kernel SVM, but there is another way, representation theory, okay? We'll see it in kernel FDA. So this is the reason why we are going deep in these algorithms to see the techniques, okay? Thank you. By the way, please form the teams and make see the announcement and please uh, advertise this course to others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay, see you, thank you.